did not kill my wife. Why don't you try it again, a little less wooden. I didn't kill my wife. What are you doing? Every time you look smug or annoyed or tense, I'm gonna hit you with a gummy bear. That's supposed to make me less tense? Let's try it again. In Gone Girl, Nick Dunn, the suspected wife killer played by Ben Affleck, is coached for a crucial television appearance by his high-priced lawyer, Tanner Bolt. Every time Nick looks unconvincing or insincere, the attorney pelts him with gummy bears. I had a moment of weakness. You're a moment? was over 15 months. After being cast in Gone Girl, Tyler Perry claimed that he didn't really know who David Fincher was, which doesn't change the fact that in this sequence, he's parodying the filmmaker's control freak reputation, a self-deprecating joke that's also a statement of intent. More than any auteur since Stanley Kubrick, Fincher has cultivated a persona as an all-controlling mastermind, clashing with studio executives, demanding extra takes, and even alienating A-list actors like Robert Downey Jr who joked that working on Zodiac was an experience akin to spending time in the Gulag. David Fincher has been described as a Hitchcockian filmmaker, and even though he doesn't make Hitchcock-style cameos in his movies, they're filled with control freaks who could easily be seen as stand-ins for their director. Although it was sold as a dark Battle of the Sexes thriller, Gone Girl is really about the battle for control. Not only control over a relationship, but also over a narrative, both for the audience within the world of the film, who tune in on cable television to hear Nick's side of the story, but also the audience out in the real world, who are invited to choose between several competing versions of reality. Control is the great theme of David Fincher's work. His new film, Mank, which premieres on Netflix in December, dramatizes the conflict between filmmaker Orson Welles and screenwriter Herman Mankiewicz over the screenplay credit of Citizen Kane contest of authorship that is one of old Hollywood's most bitterly debated myths. In this Ringer video essay, I'll examine how the theme of control manifests in some of Fincher's most important movies, either through characters who represent total mastery and dominance over their environments, or who else find themselves victimized or at the mercy of all controlling forces. In recent years, David Fincher has basically disavowed his 1993 debut Alien 3, citing studio interference that challenged his ownership and control over the material. What's interesting about the film is how it seems to play out as an allegory of its director's frustrations, with Sigourney Weaver's Ellen Ripley portrayed as a lone wolf, ignored and condescended to by the power structure of the prison planet where she's crash-landed. I thought women weren't allowed. Well, we've never had any before. But we tolerate anybody, even the intolerable. The big twist in Alien 3 is that the Xenomorph won't kill Ripley because she's carrying an alien queen inside of her, the culmination of the series' grotesque anxieties about insemination and pregnancy. For Ripley, her new status as an alien vessel grants her an immunity that she uses to help defeat the monster, only to have the film's true villains emerge in the form of the rapacious Weyland Yutani Corporation, who want to harvest her biological payload. Where is Lieutenant Ripley? Is she still alive? If she's alive, she's in the furnace. She's in the lead works with the beast. Ripley's decision to take her own life at the end of Alien 3 is a downer quite literally, as she swan dives to her demise in a fiery pit. But it's also a gesture of control over her body and over the fate of the franchise. By trusting her instincts and rejecting an offer of compromise, Ripley falls towards Grace, and she takes Alien 3 with her. By daringly killing off his heroine, as well as the alien inside of her, Fincher was attempting to exercise a conceptual version of Final Cut that would deny the possibility for further development or exploitation of intellectual material. Whatever his frustration with Alien 3, it's clear that he identifies with Ripley's self-martyring fuck you to her bosses, and that sense of defiance gives Alien 3 a certain power, even in spite of its myriad flaws and less than stellar reputation. You have to trust me. I feel like saying more, but I don't want to ruin the surprise. 
After the false start and perceived failure of Alien 3, Fincher made his mark on mainstream American cinema with the serial killer thriller 7, which may still be his most perfectly realized movie. As they say, the first cut is the deepest. Lurking beneath the script's archetypal setup of mismatched beat cops investigating a series of grisly murders, each patterned after one of the seven deadly sins, 7 is a meditation on aesthetics. The grotesque beauty of the crime scenes reflect not only the methodology of the elusive, cipher-like psychopath John Doe, but also Fincher's desire to invert our relationship to on-screen gore. The characters played by Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman may be Seven's heroes, but John Doe is its director surrogate, micromanaging his killings with an artist's eye for texture, composition, and detail. By making a movie about a puppet master, Fincher displayed his own gift for pulling the strings. The film's diabolical power is bound up in how, on a subconscious level, we want to see John Doe succeed, if only to pay off the exquisite patterning in his work and in the screenplay. In the finale, John Doe's lethal sense of control is juxtaposed against the impulsive, impetuous emotions of Brad Pitt's Detective Mills, whose partner criticizes him for his lack of restraint. David, if you kill him, he will win. Because Mills has feelings, it's easier to identify with him than with the heartless John Doe. But the fact is that Seven is very much a movie made in the latter's image. Detective Mills has the moral high ground, but John Doe has the upper hand. Listen to what you're saying! No, you're not gonna control this conversation! Why would I ever do what you're describing? Because you resent me. Stop being emotional. It kills you that I'm living my life. Lower your voice, Conrad. What? You're afraid somebody's gonna witness a scene? You're so afraid somebody's gonna see what a manipulative fucking control freak What is are. wrong with you? What are you on? Control is absolutely the theme of the game, which stars Michael Douglas as a depressive investment banker whose wealth insulates him from reality and also from the need to have normal human feelings. As the film opens, Douglas's Nicholas Van Orden is celebrating his 48th birthday, a date which has a morbid association. It's the same age at which his own father killed himself when Nicholas was a child. It's in this context of creeping dread about his own potential emptiness and depression and capacity for suicide that the film's reality-warping storyline truly resonates. Signed up for an elaborate role-playing game by his younger brother Conrad, Nicholas begins to suspect that the strange events happening around him are actually real, and that the game's architect mean not to entertain, but to kill him. What is this for? What are you selling? Oh, it's a game. A game? Specifically tailored for each participant. Think of it as a great vacation. A sterling example of a paranoid thriller filled with allusions to other examples of the genre, from Vertigo to Invasion of the Body Snatchers to the Parallax View, the game aligns itself with Nicholas's sense of confusion, even as Fincher clearly delights in the tactics of his antagonists. Every time Nicholas is terrorized by being placed in death-defying situations, the faceless, relentlessly inventive operatives of consumer recreation services serve as a mirror for the filmmaking process and the business of illusion, and as they keep tormenting Douglas, the question becomes whether this helpless, put-upon character represents an actor being pushed to the breaking point by an overzealous filmmaker, or if he's a stand-in for the movie's audience. The game is not as elegantly shaped as Seven, and its climax, which involves a literal leap of faith, arguably jumps the shark as far as narrative logic is concerned. In the hands of a different filmmaker, the game might have been an assembly line studio movie, but Fincher's fascination with control, and specifically how it feels to be on the receiving end of a carefully orchestrated conspiracy, gives it a scary and funny existential dimension. While we're here, drive in. What are you going to do anyway? You won't get your money back. I don't care about money. I'm pulling back the curtain. I want to meet the wizard. If you are seated in an emergency exit row, yeah, and feel you would be unable or unwilling to perform the duties listed on the safety card, Please ask a flight attendant to reseat you. It's a lot of responsibility. 
want to switch seats? The thesis of Fight Club is that inside every lanky, white-collar drone, a chiseled, sexy movie star rebel is waiting to break out, whether the host wants him to or not. In the film, Edward Norton's unnamed narrator feels like he has no control over his life, beyond the ability to acquire consumer items. Working for the first time with digital effects, Fincher uses his own impeccable technical control to transform the screen into a three-dimensional IKEA catalog, juxtaposing literal clutter with spiritual emptiness. There is lump of wire lamps of environmentally friendly unbleached paper. I'd flip through catalogs and wonder, what kind of dining set defines me as a person? In response to his ongoing inner crisis, the narrator externalizes his anxieties in the form of an alter ego who can fill in the blanks as far as purpose, principles, and credibility go. The flamboyant insurgent Tyler Durden is everything that Norton's narrator is not, although in light of the film's big twist, that the two are one and the same, it's more accurate to say that Tyler is what happens when the narrator lets himself go. Tyler's plans to start an underground boxing ring and then to wage a domestic terror campaign against major corporations speaks to the narrator's latent sense of rebellion and rage. Fight Club uses the pugilistic metaphor of its title, a subterranean community drenched in contagious toxic masculinity, to visualize a larger process of punching up against institutionalized power structures. Tyler is the narrator's attempt to take control, even as the plans he makes spiral schizophrenically into chaos. No less than seven, Fight Club is about a very public PR campaign where violence is used to get and keep the attention of a desensitized audience and concludes with a similar gesture of suicide as self-actualization. Tyler, I want you to really listen to me. Okay. My eyes are open. By blowing his own mind, the narrator also shocks the audience into awareness of Fight Club's big surprise. The film's dichotomy between control and release shows Fincher coming into his own as a cerebral showman. One really can't be too careful about home invasion. This is perfect. Fincher's 2002 thriller Panic Room is a case study in high-end construction. The plot is simple. After moving into an expensive new townhouse in Manhattan, a divorced mother and her daughter seek refuge in a high-tech safe room as protection from a group of violent burglars seeking a buried fortune. But read between the lines of David Kep's high-concept screenplay and what emerges is a fable of haves and have-nots, and of people living at a remove from the world who become prisoners of their own device. In order to communicate the theme of technology simultaneously protecting and entrapping his protagonists, Fincher directs Panic Room with digitized finesse, opting for swooping CGI-assisted camera movements that effortlessly map the space of the townhouse while making it clear that the characters don't have the same freedom of movement. The battle between Jodie Foster's Meg Altman and the criminals prowling through the bowels of her home is unmistakably about control, with every inch of the property transformed over the course of the film into contested territory. Meg's refusal to accept her own victimhood forces her into a newfound resourcefulness that her well-heeled lifestyle had never previously demanded. As in the game, Fincher crafts a narrative about a civilian fighting back against external forces, except where Nicholas Van Orton's wealth and insularity are critiqued, Meg's is exalted. On the level of pure craft, Panic Room may be one of Fincher's best directed movies, a technical tour de force, but it's also among his least subversive. Our heroines survive en route to a happy ending that feels dictated by Hollywood formula, a rare example of Fincher being controlled by his material instead of hot wiring or exploding it from the inside out. <laughs> I shot a man sitting in a parked car with a 38 Zodiac 12 SFPD zero. The map coupled with this code will tell you where the bomb is set. You have until next fall to dig it up. 
Halfway through his true crime masterpiece, Zodiac, David Fincher shows us the coded missives written by the title character, invading the three-dimensional space of San Francisco. We might say that the writing is on the wall, and that the Zodiac has taken control of the city's collective unconscious. Besides serving as a combination extension and critique of the serial killer mythology established in Seven, Zodiac is a movie about how an elusive mastermind sowed confusion, fear, and also semiotic dominance through his use of symbols and cryptography. Even when the killer is off screen for the entire second half of the movie, his presence hovers suffocatingly over the characters who are becoming increasingly desperate to track him down. People, the most dangerous game. Who's that? That's the, the, that's, that's the, Count Zaroff. Zaroff? With a Z? A film of oblique symbols and pop culture illusions, Zodiac pits its namesake against three men of different backgrounds and skill sets. A crusading journalist, a Top Gun cop, and an amateur codebreaker, all of whom become obsessed with discovering the murderer's identity. As Zodiac goes on, it's clear that each protagonist is playing a version of the most dangerous game. But it's the way that in the process they each go from hunter to hunted that makes Zodiac so devastating. Mr. Allen, I'm Inspector Bill Armstrong, this is Inspector Dave Toski and Sergeant Jack Mullinax. We're investigating the Zodiac murders in San Francisco and Vallejo. In the film's creepiest scene, we get a look at its most credible subject, Arthur Lee Allen, a disturbed outsider played brilliantly by John Carroll Lynch. The scene is a masterpiece of directorial control, with Fincher cutting between perspectives and gestures with speed and precision, aligning the viewer with the interrogators, even as Allen, despite being outnumbered, seems to hold all the power and authority in the confrontation. Somehow, it's like he's ganging up on the three men who've come to see him holding the camera with the gaze of somebody who never doubts that he's in control. I'm not the Zodiac. And if I was, I certainly wouldn't tell you. You are probably going to be a very successful computer person. You're gonna go through life thinking that girls don't like you because you're a nerd. And I want you to know from the bottom of my heart that that won't be true. It'll be because you're an asshole. Maybe the most sophisticated Revenge of the Nerds movie ever made, The Social Network is a campus comedy but a group of dorks, led by Jesse Eisenberg's expert impersonation of Harvard grad Mark Zuckerberg, whose attempts to leverage petty grievances against overbearing classmates and ex-girlfriends ends up reshaping global interpersonal communication. By digitizing and weaponizing his frustration at being dumped, Mark becomes a Harvard folk hero and then a visionary entrepreneur. Beginning with its screwball comic opening breakup sequence, The Social Network, as directed by Fincher and written by Aaron Sorkin, is structured as a series of battles for control, with the war over credit and compensation for Facebook's billion dollar valuation paralleled against Mark's more personal feud with the obsequious rich kids Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss. I'm 6'5", 220, and there's two of me. The flawless CGI special effects allowing Army Hammer to play both twins gives the social network a subtly technocratic texture to go along with its internet era subject matter. The movie is all about the infiltration of the digital into the physical realm. What makes the Winklevoss twins such hilarious villains is that they're unable to leverage their physical, economic, and familial advantages. They may, as they say, row crew, but Mark's muscles are in his brain. Even as the social network remains ambivalent about the ultimate nature of its anti-hero's achievement in creating Facebook, a legacy made even more complicated in recent years, the film is easily the millennium's most compelling cinematic treatment of startup ambition and achievement, playing out as something between a how-to manual and a cautionary tale. Mark! He's wired in. Sorry? He's wired in. Is he? Yes. How about now? You're still wired in? In the next book, Amazing Amy became a prodigy. You play volleyball? I got caught freshman year. She made varsity. Why didn't you have a dog? She got the dog. Puddles made her more relatable. Wow. Although the characters in Gone Girl were created by novelist Gillian Flynn, the film's villainous Amy Dunn is a classic Fincher creation a fanatical micromanager with a type A personality. In the film's first half, Rosamund Pike's manicured precision is set against Ben Affleck's slovenly laziness. 
with Nick acting bewildered as he struggles to put together the puzzle pieces in a game as elaborate as anything engineered by John Doe or CRS. The narrative twist in Gone Girl is that Amy isn't really dead. She's gone, by her own choice and by her own hand. The turnabout is how the character goes from a master orchestrator trying to get revenge on her husband to an improviser living by her wits. On the run, she's forced to alter her appearance and identity. The Hitchcockian complicity of Gone Girl manifests in our desire, however conflicted, to see Amy triumph in a series of back-to-the-wall situations. When she murders Neil Patrick Harris's Desi as part of an escape plan to get back with Nick, it's a nightmarishly sexualized vision of control, with the character ending up literally and figuratively on top in a life-or-death struggle. Ultimately, Gone Girl was a movie about a PR campaign. Nick's attempt to control the narrative about whether or not he's a wife killer is trumped by Amy's hilariously stage-managed resurrection. Fainting in his arms in front of the camera, she feigns unconsciousness, but nevertheless has the upper hand. The film ends in a stalemate that could be taken as a parody of domestic bliss or a realistic assessment of the compromises inherent to any monogamous relationship. Even if the answer is that it's both, the ambiguity comes out of Fincher's scrupulous, satirical control of his potboiler material. By building in space for contemplation in Gone Girl's final moments, he's also turning the screws. We hope that you enjoyed this Ringer video essay. Are there any other control freaks in David Fincher's cinema that we missed? Do we think that Mank fits into this overview of his work? Sound off in the comments and be safe out there.